Welcome to another inspirational message from Chowdean Community Church, Gateshead. For more information about Chowdean, visit www.chowdean.org.uk. We hope you enjoy the podcast. So, we're continuing this morning, we're looking at the series on God Uncovered and looking at the various lenses that distort our view of God. Now, I mentioned a little while back that the inspiration for this series came from a book called 30,000 Sunrises and the Challenge of Identity. It was, it was written by a former member of this church, Nick Matthews. Now, in his book, Nick suggests that the lens that distort our view of God are doubt, fear, or entitlement. Now, Nick has very kindly made this book a Kindle version of it, available to us on Amazon for one pound. So if you'd like to get a copy of the book, if you've got an e-reader, if if you'd like to get a copy of this book from Amazon, it's one pound, but there's only one more week left of that special offer, and then it'll go back up to the proper price. So this morning, we're looking at the view that God is silent, absent, distant, which means that we're viewing God through the lens of doubt. Now, Doubt is not an unforgivable sin. It's okay to sometimes have doubts. Almost every Christian has doubts from time to time. Even some of the stalwarts through the ages have suffered from bouts of doubt. Martin Luther, in the Reformation, he battled constantly with depression and doubt. He once wrote, For more than a week, Christ was wholly lost. And the author, Philip Yancey's father-in-law, who was a lifelong Bible teacher, found that in his later years, his faith was troubled. He had a degenerative nerve disease, which confined him to bed and prevented him from doing a lot of the things that he'd previously enjoyed doing. And at a time of crisis, when his daughter was gravely ill, he had some financial problems, and he wrote to his family, saying that he now felt a bit uneasy about some of the things that he'd previously taught. But he could believe with absolute certainty three things. Life is difficult. God is merciful. Heaven is sure. Three things. Life is difficult. God is merciful. Heaven is sure. And the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament said, Surely you are a God who hides himself. Peter He was one of Jesus' closest friends, and even after three years of walking with the Lord, he had doubts to the point of denying that he knew Jesus at all. And Thomas, he was another one of Jesus' followers, he earned the title of Doubting Thomas. When the other disciples told Thomas that Jesus was alive after the crucifixion, well, Thomas just couldn't believe it. You know, it seemed too fantastic. But the important thing about Thomas was Although he wasn't on the same page as the other disciples, he didn't walk away. He stayed. He was still there with the other believers. So if you're here today and you've got some doubts about the Christian faith, about whether Jesus really was the Son of God, doubts about whether he really did rise from the dead, I'm just going to encourage you not to leave, but to just stick with it because you never know when God might just do something that will completely change your life. Now, I mentioned these people who doubted and could mention several more writers who have wrote about losing closeness with God. Even the psalmists felt that God had vanished on occasion. I mention this not to deter anybody from faith, but just to be realistic. What we have to offer the world is not success, you know, not get saved and give your life to Jesus and it's plain sailing all the way. What we have to offer the world is grace, The grace of God who continues with us in spite of our weak faith and the problems of life. C.S. Lewis said, The Christian has a great advantage over other men, not by being less fallen or sinful than they, or less doomed to live in a fallen world, but by knowing he is a fallen man in a fallen world. And that knowledge about ourselves drives us closer to God. Doubt is the skeleton in the cupboard of faith 
and the best way to deal with skeletons is to bring them out into the open. We confess to God when we have doubts. We ask him for revelation and reassurance. He is our father who loves us and we trust him even if occasionally we have some doubts. And I believe that when we confess our doubts, it's an opportunity for growth because doubt prompts us to think and to ask questions. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a lot of unanswered questions. But in his book, Reaching for the Invisible God, Philip Yancey said, I have to face the fact that Christians live in poverty, get sick, lose their hair and teeth and wear spectacles at approximately the same rate as everybody else. And Christians die at exactly the same rate, 100%. But I read recently about a man who had served in ministry for over 30 years. And he said, there are two kinds of faith. One says, if, and the other says, though. One says, if everything goes well in my life, and if I'm happy, and if no one I love dies, and I'm successful, then I will continue to believe in a good God. The other says, though I sweat in Gethsemane, Though I must drink my cup at Calvary, nevertheless, I will trust in the Lord who made me. So this morning, can we, like Job, who was another man, a prophet in the Old Testament, Job, no matter what happens to me, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. So we're going to move on now and just see how doubt, those doubts can distort our view of God. Firstly, that God is absent or distant. It would be impossible for God to be absent from the universe. He's the sustainer of the universe. Without God, it would all implode. Psalm 139 verses 7 to 10 say, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your right hand will hold me fast. You know, I used to have it in my mind that God always knew where we were because he was some kind of spiritual satellite tracking device, you know, that he always knew where everybody was. And I thought, it's a mystery really. But when you think about it, God is in us. That's how he knows where we are all the time and what we're thinking. However, there are times when we feel that God is absent. He isn't, but there's no sense of his presence with us. He seems distant. King David in Psalm 143 prayed, Do not hide your face from me. Psalm 142 verse 4 in the message translation says, I look for someone to come and help me, but no one, no one gives a passing thought. No one will help me. No one cares a bit about me. And I wonder if you've ever felt like that. It's not true. But the psalmists were being honest before God about how they felt at the time. And remember that we are looking through a lens of doubt. God is not a liar. He cannot lie. And Jesus said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. And Jesus promised that he would send another, the Holy Spirit, who would be with us, and who would be in us. And that is the truth. Now, I have to be honest. When I was thinking about this subject, it caused me to ask myself a few questions. Now, always in my morning times alone with God, I like to write thoughts down in the journal. And one morning I wrote this, and I wrote down, I'm preparing a sermon on God being absent, distant, and silent. But really, I'm a bit stuck. Am I sufficiently aware of the presence of God on a daily basis to really notice his absence? Now, if you're one of those people who are constantly on the mountaintop, you know, and always basking in the glory, aware of God's presence all the time, just ignore me for a moment because I was just honestly questioning, not questioning the basics of the faith that Jesus is God, that he came to earth and he lived as a man and he did many miracles, and he died to pay the price for our sins. He conquered death, 
and rose again on the third day. Absolutely convinced of that. You know, I have no doubt whatsoever. God is real. Jesus is alive. Our sins have been cancelled. But I was just questioning, how could I tell that God was right there in my living room at that moment? Would I notice the difference if he wasn't? So I was writing these thoughts down, and then I turned to my daily reading book. And the first words I read were, notion your mind with the idea that God is there. Then, when there are difficulties, it is as easy as breathing to remember. In other words, get it into your head that God is there. Because faith has to start in the mind with what we believe. Faith always means believing what cannot be proven, committing to that of which we cannot be sure. If there was evidence of which we could be certain, then it wouldn't be faith. Sight would replace faith, and it's faith which is pleasing to God. And you know, God is here. God is here right now in this place. We just have to believe that. We just have to have it in our mind. God is here. Now we think, wouldn't it be great if God would just make it a bit more obvious, you know, if he would show himself a bit more? But I suspect if he did, that would deny us our freedom to choose. The theologian Karl Barth insisted, God is free, free to reveal himself or conceal himself, to intervene or not intervene, to work within nature or outside of it, to rule over the world, or to even be despised and rejected by the world to display himself or limit himself. Faith begins in the mind, not seeing is believing, but believing is seeing. And we have to rely on the facts as we know them from the Bible. I expect you've seen this illustration before. Facts are the engine. Faith follows facts, and then feelings follow on. We cannot rely on feelings. Feelings change too much. It's facts about the Bible and about the Lord Jesus remain the same. We put our faith in the facts and not how we feel. If we rely on feelings, we'll be getting nowhere. We should persevere at the disciplines of prayer, Bible study, and waiting on God, even when we don't feel like it. Now, Ruth spoke to us last week, and she was saying that some of the elements that she was speaking about, God is holy and mysterious and unapproachable, some of those things were actually true. God is holy, God is mysterious, but he's never unapproachable. And I think this is, is the opposite way around because God is never absent or distant. But there can be times when he is silent. There are times when God is silent, although the Bible teaches that the heavens declare the glory of God. You know, creation is always speaking. Romans 1 verse 20 says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. Now, many years ago, I went to a Bible conference where Ron Dunn was the speaker, and I loved his preaching. He was one of my favorite preachers. And on this occasion, he spoke on when God is silent. Now, his son had suffered from mental health problems and had taken his own life. And at a time when Rod and his wife Kay most especially needed God, there appeared to be nothing. God was silent. And he wrote a book on this subject. And as I say, I heard him preach. It was, it was a wonderful sermon, When God is Silent. So after the conference, I bought the cassette tape to listen to again. And when I got home and tried to play the tape, it was completely blank. And I thought, this, you know, could be a great marketing opportunity. I could buy blank tapes, call them God's silence, and sell them. <laughs> I'm really not sure it would take off, though. But perhaps before we look at God's silence, we should consider for a few moments, does God still speak to people today? There are people who think that, you know, they're cessationists and they think that um, God stopped speaking after the Bible was written. You know, the Bible was written and that's it. God doesn't speak anymore. But the continuationist view is that God continues to speak to people personally today. 
Now, I'm in that latter category. I believe that God does speak to people, and he does speak in a personal way. A.W. Tozer said, We are indeed victims of a divided psychology. If we think that God is mute and only vocal in a book, as though a long, silent God decided to speak, only to lapse back into silence. And Jesus said, you see, I'm just simple. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. I'm one of his sheep. I think I should know his voice. And often it's not that God is silent, but that we are not listening. We suffer from this kind of spiritual ADHD, attention deficit disorder. And there's mobile phones and there's iPads and there's so many television channels and and so many demands on our time and so many distractions that we just don't take time to listen. We're never still enough to hear God. In 1 Kings, we read that God wasn't in the great and powerful wind. God wasn't in the earthquake. He wasn't in the fire. God was in the gentle whisper. And to hear a whisper, we need to be quiet and still. C.S. Lewis said, A sure way to promote God's absence is to avoid silence, avoid solitude, avoid any train of thought that leads off the beaten track, concentrate on money, sex, status, health, and above all, your own grievances. And I thought, ooh, let's be honest. If we're thinking about our own grievances, we're very unlikely to hear God's voice. But perhaps you have doubts that God would choose to speak to you. You know, would he speak to you personally? There are those who think that they're they're not important, you know, they're insignificant, that God wouldn't be bothered with them. There's no way the God of the universe would have time to speak to me. But nobody is unimportant to God. He loves each one of us equally and passionately. To God, we are precious and valuable beyond imagining. Now, I don't want to give the impression that God is speaking every day. But unless we are continuing in a known sin, you know, something that we know very nicely is not right, then silence doesn't necessarily mean that God is displeased with us. Colin and I love each other, but there are lots of times when we're just happy in each other's company without speaking. So looking at ways that God speaks to us, God is very creative and we are all different. So there are lots of ways that God can speak. But first and foremost is through the Bible. 2 Timothy 3 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And I want to make it clear that when God speaks, he never contradicts the Bible. I was watching something on television a little while ago. I think it might have been an episode of Midsummer Murders, but the vicar was having an affair with a married member of his congregation. In this vicar, he said that God had brought them together and that it was God's plan. And I'm sitting in my living room thinking, oh, no, it isn't. No, no, no. That would contradict the Bible. But sometimes God speaks to us through another person, sometimes the preacher on a Sunday morning. A few years ago, things were you know, pretty difficult in our family. We couldn't see an end to it. There appeared no light uh, to the tunnel that we were in at the time. And Steve Riley came here to preach, and he said, your now is not forever. And I wrote that down in my journal when I got home, and I'm happy to say that eventually he was right. So if you're facing a time of difficulty, let me say it, your now is not forever. There are times when God just drops an impression or a thought into your mind that you know is not your own thought. It just takes you by surprise, and you know it's not something that you thought of yourself. Years ago, I was driving down the side of Saltwell Park, and there was a whole carpet of daffodils all the way down the side. And I said out loud, I was in the car by myself, but I said, Lord Jesus, your daffodils are beautiful. And instantly I heard, not an audible voice, just a voice in my head that said, I made them for you. And I, you know, I was so, I could get choked now. I was so completely taken by surprise. I had to struggle to keep control, to think the one who left heaven to come to earth, to give us salvation, to bring us back into a relationship with the Father, to prepare a beautiful place in heaven for us, would give us all of nature to enjoy here. Such overwhelming goodness. So on occasion, God's voice is an impression. 
a sense of knowing, but it must always, always be backed up with scripture. God may speak to us through the words of a song, a hymn, and throughout the Bible, God spoke to people in all kinds of unusual ways, burning bushes, rainbows, dreams, visions, even donkeys that could talk. Our God is a creative God, and he's not limited in the way that he speaks to his people. There are things that I have no answers for, things that I don't really know that, you know, things that I've questioned and I, I don't really know. And I, I think when we get to heaven, it'll all become clear. And to be honest, I think that when we see Jesus face to face, none of it will matter. I don't think we'll be bothered when we see him there. So there are many things we have no answers for, much that we can't understand this side of heaven. But the more we know of the character of God, the more we trust him. There are times when there are no answers, no sense of God's presence, and no comforting words. Only new and kind of phrase, the ministry of absence. And it is a ministry. We sing, and we're going, I've asked Lorraine if I can sing it at the end. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. Through every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. When Sam spoke to us a few weeks ago, he said, you know, trials that we have in life, things that go wrong, our problems, develop character in us. And times of God's seeming absence can be times of important growth. At those times, it drives us to seek God more. In the Screwtape Letters, which is a, a parody written by C.S. Lewis, who also wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, the senior devil, Screwtape, is his advising his minion, Wormwood, that at the beginning of a spiritual life, a believer may sense the closeness of God's presence, a dangerous state that demons will have few weapons against. But later, many opportunities against the enemy, God, arise. He says, it's during such tough periods, more than during the peak periods, that it is growing into the creature that he wants it to be. Hence, the prayers offered in the state of dryness are those that please him best. He wants them to learn to walk and must therefore take away his hand. And if only the will to walk is there, he is pleased even with their stumbles. Do not be deceived, Wormwood. Our cause is never more in danger than when a human, no longer desiring, but still intending to do our enemy's will, looks around a universe from which every trace of him seems to have vanished, asks why he has been forsaken and still obeys. I'm going to show you a short DVD now. It's by Michael Willem, and it's called When God is Silent, and I love it. But it's, the picture quality is a bit dark, but it's not important because it's the words that are important. <laughs> C.S. Lewis once said that his great fear is not that God does not exist, but that he is a God who abandons. We are not designed to live in silence. We are not isolated beings. Our feelings are modeled after a God who, putting relationship in such great priority, exists as three separate entities in one, Father, Spirit, and Son. His essence is affection. His nature is connection. And who we are is a pursuit of him. If we are the branches, then he is the limb. And an absence of God is the very definition of hell. Us without him negates our purpose. It betrays our every cell. So it is no wonder then that when God is silent, it seems more cruel, more painful, more seemingly sadistic than anything else he could inflict on us. For in testing, there is progress. A trial is a process, but in silence, there is nothing. The key to a lasting relationship is communication, communication, communication. But in silence, we are stuck at an impasse of frustration. Silence is debilitating, isolating, emasculating. It makes us feel more than powerless because it robs us of the option of choice. How can I plead my case when my words fall into a void? How can this relationship survive when it is starved of the oxygen of your voice? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You knew. You knew, and I choose. 
I choose to believe that your silence is not a dam, but a fountain. That when I cannot hear from you, it is because you're busy elevating my perspective from the valley to the mountain. I choose because your ways are not my ways. Your thoughts are not mine. Your plans for good are greater than time. We live in sin. We live in skin and cannot understand the intentions of the divine. I choose these things because I appeal to a time when your spirit called out to mine. And while my vision may be blurry now, I once felt your presence as close as my body could humanly allow. You were real to me then, you are real to me now. So I put my trust in you. And when my trust fails, I will fall on well-established faith. For if simple silence can make my faith fall apart, then it was only a mere house of cards to start. And when my faith is weak, I will look to your word. And when your word feels as silent as you, when assurances of everlasting love no longer do, I will turn to that which I've known to be true. I will look to my memory, praying that my knowledge of your once tangible presence drowns out my vacuum of now. You were real to me then, you are real to me now. And when my memory is faint and my heart is spent, I will take full advantage of the Psalm's permission to lament. And I will cry out, my deep will cry out. And when there is nothing left to say, I will sit and I will wait on you. He says, you were real to me then, you are real to me now. I choose. Not in your mind with the idea that God is there. And when trust and faith fail, When God's word becomes silent, we rely on memory. We recall the times in the past when God has spoken to us, when his presence seemed more real. We look back to ground ourselves in what God has already done to gain confidence for the future. And finally, when all else fails, we wait. We wait on God with trust. You were real to me then, you are real to me now. And just to remind you, your now is not forever. This is the end of this message. We hope you enjoyed it. If you want to find out more about our church, please visit www.chowdean.org.uk and please take a minute to rate our podcast on iTunes.